You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space, reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. It may look like I'm here, but I'm really not. I'm taking the week off, doing some diving with my 17-year-old son in the Cayman Islands. We'd love to be with you, but... That one trumps twists hands down. So while I am diving, the shuttle has been getting ready to go in the other direction. Twist correspondent David Waters has a preview of the mission ahead. The countdown clock is ticking to the penultimate flight for Space Shuttle Discovery on its 13-day trip to the International Space Station. It's the last scheduled seven-person shuttle mission. This one will mark the first time four women have been in space at the same time, with three on the shuttle and one on station. Discovery is hauling a moving van of sorts called Leonardo for its last round trip to the station. Leonardo is a multi-purpose logistics module, or MPLM for short. Well, it's a huge silver cylinder. Uh, it's about 15 feet in diameter and about 60 feet long, and the reason for that is it has to fit inside the shuttle's payload bay, and those are basically the dimensions of the shuttle's cargo area. Uh, what we'll do is we'll pluck it out with uh, the shuttle arm and hand it off to the station arm and plug it into the, to the uh, International Space Station. Once it's plugged in, we hook it up, make sure it's airtight, open the door and go inside and start to transfer all that cargo. So it's, it's basically, if people can use the analogy that we're, we're moving stuff from one house to another, if you will, mm -hmm. And it's our U-Haul, it's our cargo carrier, and, and we, instead of driving it into the driveway and opening the back and carrying all the stuff out, we do it a little differently and we bring it up in the space shuttle and hook it up to the bottom of the station. First time flyer Naoko Yamazaki will be loadmaster, making sure everything gets to the right place. After taking off eight tons of supplies, the crew will pack it to the gills with stuff that needs to come home, from experiments that need to be checked out on Earth to old hardware and the trash. It'll take a combined 100 hours to get everything moved. The big activity of transferring, of bringing all that stuff on and taking all the stuff off, it may sound very simple, but it has to be quite uniquely choreographed because we want to make sure that we don't forget anything or we don't do anything incorrectly. So it's very important that we know what we take, where we put it, what we get from the station, and where it goes back in the MPLM. The mission will also focus on getting a new 1,800-pound ammonia tank installed. The tank is the size of a standalone freezer and will take all of the mission's planned spacewalks to get it swapped out with an old tank. The spacewalkers are Rick Mastracchio and Clayton Anderson. The big ticket for 131 is Rick and I will replace an ammonia tank assembly. The ammonia tank assemblies basically provide the coolant to the system so when it's, it's like Freon in your air conditioner at home but we use ammonia on the outside of the station. So we have a huge tank. It's about 1,800 pounds. It's probably the size of a, oh, a, a double freezer, refrigerator freezer mm -hmm. component. And it lives on the back side toward the center of the station. And there are actually two, one on the right and one on the left. And the one on the left has recently been changed out by another shuttle crew. So we're going to change the one on the right. So what happens is the sh we bring up a brand new one in the shuttle. We have to get that one ready to move and get that one ready for the arm to grab and they take it away and then we undo the old one and the arm will move the old one to the front of the station for a temporary stowage place. We'll install the new, then we'll take the old and put it back in the shuttle to bring it home and it will be refurbished to be used later. It's a pretty challenging scenario because the as big as the space station robotic arm is, we can't base it in one place and reach all the way into the back of the payload bay which is where the new ammonia tank assembly is, and then reach back over the backside of the space station's truss to where we're going to install it. So it requires three spacewalks. They'll also replace a rate gyro assembly that helps tell the station what attitude it's in. Meanwhile, the space station crew is getting a new workout machine, but this isn't something you'd find at your local gym. It's difficult to exercise in space because you weigh nothing, so muscles atrophy. A bad deal for long-term space flyers like space station crew. Another experiment will allow space station crews to study weather damage to crops on Earth. Discovery is scheduled to return to Kennedy Space Center 13 days after liftoff and will then be prepped for its last mission, which also happens to be the last ever scheduled space shuttle flight. Don't forget to join us for the launch. We are the best place to watch it all unfold. Our coverage begins at 2 a.m. Eastern, 0600 GMT.
ouch. Hey, with four launches left, I promise not to complain. Now for a look at some other space news this week, let's bring back David Waters. Thanks, Miles. A Soyuz rocket carrying members of the Expedition 23 crew to the International Space Station blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Primary One, liftoff. liftoff. Before making their way to the launch pad, Alexander Skvortsov, Mikhail Kornienko, and Tracy Caldwell Dyson ran the gauntlet of Russian pre-launch rituals, which include watching a movie called White Sun of the Desert the night before launch, sipping a glass of champagne, signing a door at the Cosmonaut Hotel, getting blessed by a Russian Orthodox priest, and taking a ceremonial leak on the tire of one of the crew buses. Women can take a pass on that last one if they want, which was probably a relief to Tracy Caldwell Dyson. She also added what could become a new tradition, serenading her spouse. Once they arrive at the ISS, the new crew members will only have a few days to settle in before house guests arrive aboard Shuttle Discovery. The Obama administration wants to cancel the Constellation program that would have returned astronauts to the moon. But until the NASA budget is approved by Congress, that program continues like a dead man walking, perhaps. But good news for all you taxpayers who think it might be a good idea to mind a few pennies. NASA's chief engineer has approved the program's request to discontinue using the metric system. According to the NASA Inspector General's office, it would cost $368 million to make Constellation metric compliant. It seems like they're using some older hardware and software developed in a pre-metric era. The OIG report noted that money could be better spent mitigating higher priority program risks. Engineers at NASA Langley Research Center are jumping into the Toyota Unintended Acceleration Investigation. Nine staffers from the NASA Engineering and Safety Center will join with the Department of Transportation and National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to try to get to the bottom of what might be causing a rash of incidents in which Toyota cars have taken off in a runaway manner. The NASA engineers have specific expertise in vehicle electronics, which is an area where investigators really want to drill down. The Mars rover Spirit is silent. It missed a communications session with ground controllers this week, which likely means it's sleeping or gone into hibernation mode as winter descends on Mars' southern hemisphere. Spirit's operators knew this was coming. The rover has been stuck in sand for nearly a year without a tow truck in sight. In January, with winter coming, mission managers gave up trying to drive to concentrate on better positioning the rover so it could catch some sun, so its solar panels would be more optimally tilted towards the sun. Unfortunately, that didn't work very well. The best guess as to what happened is that Spirit's batteries have drained and there's not enough sunlight hitting the solar panels to recharge them. Will the rover survive the long, cold winter and wake up six months from now to resume its science mission? Well, we'll keep you posted. Waka, 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 waka. Okay, wait, cue the real sound. Yeah, that's it, it's Pac-Man. No, wait, it's Saturn's moon, my mess. No, it's Pac-Man. Okay, fine, it's both. Those are the hot spots on my mess as detected by an infrared spectrometer aboard the Cassini spacecraft during a flyby of the moon, February 13th. Reds and yellows are warmer areas. Warm being a relative term here. They're about 92 Kelvin or negative 294 degrees Fahrenheit. Why the difference in temperature? Researchers aren't sure, but think it could have something to do with different textures on the surface. The other question remaining, are the ghosts hiding on Saturn's other moons? Hmm. And speaking of Cassini, check out Canyon Country on Saturn's moon Titan. This is a computer-generated image of the surface of Titan based on radar data from Cassini. It shows so-called karst topography similar to parts of Utah, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and China. The Titan landscape was formed when liquid methane dissolved rocks, leaving behind hills and valleys. Hmm, Jamaica and Puerto Rico. That looks like a good place for a vacation. Meanwhile, back on Earth, physicists got down to business unlocking the secrets of the universe. They cranked up the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, and smashed some protons together at 7 trillion electron volts. That's the highest energy ever achieved by a particle accelerator. The idea is to recreate the moments just after the Big Bang by smashing these subatomic particles together to look for other particles and forces 
that have been theorized but not directly observed. Ultimately, they hope to learn more about the mysterious dark matter that's found throughout the universe and find the mystery Higgs boson particle, a particle that would help explain where mass comes from. The theory is the Higgs boson particle gives you and everything around you mass just by interacting with the particles that make you up. The more something interacts with the theoretical Higgs boson particle, the heavier it is. What astronaut worth his salt wouldn't be looking to work in an April Fool's joke on orbit? Three merry pranksters led by troublemaker-in-chief T.J. Creamer decided to see if they could get a smile out of Capcom Shannon Lucid. Check this out. How'd they do that? That's pretty cool. We have a lot of work to do, you know. Oh, Mom, can I stay out longer? <laughs> no, you've got to come in. <laughs> okay, back to work we go. <laughs> well, that's too bad. <laughs> Fittingly, we end where we began with the shuttle, but Atlantis this time. That orbiter is still snug in her orbiter processing facility, but workers at the Kennedy Space Center mated her external tank and solid rocket boosters a few days ago. Atlantis is set to roll over to the vehicle assembly building on April 15th. Rollout to the launch pad 39A will be about a week later. And the shuttle will lift off on what's scheduled to be her final flight May 14th. Godspeed Atlantis. Miles. Thanks, David, and thanks to you for joining us. Special thanks to our sponsor this week, Binary Space. We really appreciate the support. Remember, the shuttle Discovery is slated to launch on its penultimate mission on Monday, 6.21 a.m. Eastern, 10.21 GMT. Our coverage on spaceflightnow.com begins at 2 a.m. Early for us, but you won't hear me moan. After all, I'll be in the front row. And if you join us, you will too. We'll see you then.